Good day, and welcome to another exciting episode of A History of Theology and Humor. Today, we're looking at the continent as opposed to America or Britain. And around 1541, Pope Paul III's Master of Ceremonies, Theagio de Cessna, came up upon Michelangelo's painting of the Sistine Chapel. And he was outraged at what he saw was a public bathhouse with all of its nudes. So Michelangelo responded with a lot of wit. He said uh, he painted him in as the judge of the underworld, uh, Minos, completely with the ears of an ass, as you can see in this painting, um, and also a strategically placed snake to cover his little whatever it was. So he complained to the Pope, uh, de Cessna, and the pontiff replied that if the artist had placed him in purgatory, the Pope could have done something about it. However, the Pope said, God has given me authority in heaven and on earth, but my power does not extend to hell. You will just have to put up with it. Now, where we see next is that Pope Paul IV followed, and he cut off Michelangelo's pension completely. And he also mandated the nudes of the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel should be covered for modesty's sake. And Michelangelo, of course, ignored all of this. And this is going to be the beginning of, of the Vatican's fig leaf campaign uh, that we see with Pope Paul IV, also known earlier as Cardinal Carafa. Now, we move next to Pope Paul and what he did looking at the Last Judgment. He said it's a stew of nudes, and he demanded changes. But Michelangelo, just as wry as ever, retorted, tell his supreme holiness that this is a mere trifle and can easily be done. Let him mend the world. Paintings are easily mended. Now, however, the great artist did die, and one of his students, um, the Volterra, was hired to kind of paint over it, over all the naughty bits. And he unfortunately became known as Mr. Underpants and uh, kind of the, the key person in the fig leaf campaign. Now, one person who was influenced by this comes next, and that's the Renaissance poet uh, Du Ballet. And Du Ballet was a wonderful kind of French linguist and really elevated the French language, become a language of poetry. And he went down and served as a diplomat in Rome. Next, when he went there, we find that during his stay at the papal court, Du Ballet became quite homesick. And he wrote a book called The Regrets, kind of a series of reflections of what he saw. And he found that Rome was quite decadent sprawling with hypocrites, thieves, and snobs. And that was just in the Vatican. And so he pens his melancholy satire, and he mocks how the cardinals would just bet on who will be the next pope. And basically, he said, they, they make popes out of thin air. There is no rhyme or reason or holiness to it all. But next he attacked, and this was a little earlier, because uh, Carlo Carafa had not become yet this really angry Pope Paul IV. And he attacks the vices of him. For example, Carafa, before he became Pope, had placed Jews in ghettos and forced them to wear distinctive yellow hats and clothing. And you can see the little kind of top hat on the right image uh, down there at the bottom. And uh, he also set up a Roman Inquisition when some Italians actually went Protestant. Kind of, they wanted to reform the Vatican. And Carafa vowed, even if my own father were a heretic, I would gather the wood to burn him. And so Du Ballet ridicules the Pope's three-tiered crown of gold versus what Jesus had, his crown of thorns. And you remember from Jonathan Swift and his tale of the tub, how they would mock this three-tiered crown that became dominant this time. And then he also kind of mocked uh, the Vatican. He said, where Jupiter had but one Ganymede, one little boy catamite for toy or plaything, the Pope has more than 50. Now, that leads next to some other things that the Belay mocked. He mocked those monks who tried to exercise, exercise possessed young women, and they would do it by feeling them up and down on their belly and their breast. But next in the regrets, he aligned himself with what he called the talking statue of Rome, this great tradition of Pasquino, Pasquino. Pasquino, as a statue of, of Hercules, was kind of set forth and his role was to provide an outlet for any kind of satirical protest against the Pope, the Cardinals, the Vatican, or even the French. 
people would post poems and notices on this statue of a kind of a de-armed Hercules. In fact, it was probably easier for Hercules to clean up the Aegean stables than for the Italians to tidy up a filthy Vatican. Dubelet humbly acknowledged his satire. He said, now I call myself a Pasquino. Pasquino, the people's laughingstock. I began to basically post my notes and post my little observations and my regrets. But he said, the true calling of Pasquino was to spare no one, but to sing out vices with a public voice, with pasquinades. And there are going to be others who are going to follow him on this, and it's going to have a much more lasting effect. What we see next is that finally the notorious Pope Paul IV died. And the citizens of Rome revolted. The first thing they did, they freed hundreds of prisoners. They went and they burned the records of the inquisitor's office. And then they murdered the inquisitor just for extra keeping. And then they removed the Carafa family coat of arms from all the churches and monuments. We talk about tearing down statues. But here was a group of people who just erased every part of the history of Pope Paul IV. Next, we see that following the model of Du Ballet, crowds, these same crowds, scribbled the following Pasquinita upon the statue. Carafa, hated by the devil and the sky, is buried here with his rotting corpse. Erebus, who was the Greek god of darkness, has taken his spirit. Carafa hated peace on earth. Our faith he contested. He ruined the church and the people. Men and sky were offended. Treacherous friend, suppliant with the army, which was ultimately fatal to him. You want to know more? Pope was him, and that is enough. Next, we find that even today, you can find statues like the Virginia Wesleyan statue of John Wesley, where I often have my students go over and write pasquinades. Unfortunately, they write pasquinades about their short professor rather than John Wesley. But that is the whole purpose of a pasquinade. Next, we move back to Spain. And in Spain, Francesco de Quiriverdo was known for his short, rapid, witty wordplay, his conceits or his conceptimismo in his dreams, in his visions. And where we see that next is, is in short, he says, not only are things not what they seem, they are not even what they are called. He recognized what Orwell and Huxley would later see in kind of a changing of the language of this kind of brave new world for one thing to mean something else, something that would be picked up by the Nazis not too far in the future too. But next he said, for example, we all wish to reach a ripe old age, but none of us are prepared to admit that we are already there. I am already there in the winter of my life, and I am glad to confess it. Now, next we find that, like Alexander Pope, Puverto was handicapped physically. He was overweight. He club-footed. He suffered extreme myopia, hence you see on his little cartoon face, his little pince nez, and he had a very silly mustache. But he was one of the wittiest and most verbally dexterous and cheerful poets that could come out of this time of the golden age of Spain. Next, we find that he says, it is a bitter truth of what I am observing. But not only was he a moralist, but he played the buffoon to make sure that people understood what he was saying and he could say it with laughter. Next, however, he was in Valencia defamed by a very famous libel. The court of the rightful revenge erected against the writings of Francesco de Quiverda, teacher of errors, doctor in shamelessness, license in buffoonery, bachelor in dirt, university professor of vices, and proto-devil among men. He was slandered in so many ways, but that didn't bother him at all. In fact, next, he created The History of the Life of a Swindler, a very picaresque novel and a satire. And it follows this one fellow, Pablos, who is a pacaro. He's a rogue. He's, he's kind of a, a ne'er-do-well who kind of wanders around and tries to kind of make life better for himself. Of course, at the end of the book, he heads to America, where all the rascals kind of end up anyway. 
But we find next that Cliverdo attacked the schemes of the Spanish in their wars in the low countries of Belgium and Netherlands. In the swindler, Pablos meets a schemer who plans to help the king, Spanish king's armies capture the Dutch stronghold of Ostend by using sponges to suck up the sea water that protected the city's fortresses. SpongeBob SquarePants may have been a Spanish invention at this time. But the great thing we see next are his dreams, his sueños of hell, his visions of hell. In fact, in one of the dreams of the Last Judgment, we find kind of three people arguing about who was the best betrayer, the best traitor of Christ. And Judas, Muhammad, and Martin Luther argue. And it seems that Judas is going to lose much to his own chagrin. Next, we find that what he wrote was a prologue addressed to the readers of his book, these nameless and ungrateful readers who are us. And he doesn't use the usual fawning welcome of what a great reader you are to read such a great book. But he looks at the reader and he mocks us. He says, so perverse a fellow are you that I place you under no obligation by addressing you as pious or benevolent or kind as other books do. You may try to spruce yourself up, but I know what you look like. It's going to be interesting because Francesco Goya later on is going to take many of these same kind of ideas and put them into his La Caprices uh, that will really be wonderful satire there. Next, in The Bedeviled Constable, one of the dreams that he has, he talks about devils become frightened when they're trying to possess a man. They suddenly realize it's a policeman. And so they don't want to inhabit such a character who doesn't flee from the sign of the cross. He uses it for a cover of his own sins. And so people were afraid of inquisitors and constables. And the evil spirit even complains that the constable is more diabolical than he is himself. And he begs to be exercised of the constable. Next, in one of his medieval visions of hell, he dreams of a host of people being led out of hell. These people look like they're escaping, but there's a procession that comes from the hottest areas of the inferno. He asks the devil, why? What's happening here? And he is told that the beautiful women, the priests, and the lawyers serve hell much better as recruiters on earth, as they deceive some and seduce others into sin. Now, next, the one thing that scares all the demons of hell, there's one thing that chases them into cowering and covering wherever they can go, and that's the duenna. The duenna is the chaperone. She is that older woman who acts as a governess and a companion in charge of girls. And everyone in Spain, including the inquisitors and the devils, were afraid of the duenna. Next, though, we find that the first dream he has closes with a glimpse of hell itself. And we find in hell that lawyers are using syllogisms to try to get themselves out of the hot water there. Bankers are trying to find monetary concessions. They're still trying to make money. A doctor is stuffed down a urinal, while an apothecary is sealed up in a medicine jar. Everyone, ironically, gets the judgment of their own estate. But the greatest part is that poets are tormented by being forced to listen to praise being heaped upon the work of other poets. Nothing gets an author than having to sit and hear praises of your rivals. Now, in the cartoon, we find that someone is saying, the devil is saying, I hope you're not a lawyer or a politician. We're trying to diversify down here. And that is also the next cartoon when two men in hell discover this is worse than I thought. Satan himself is a lawyer, too. And then we find for our contemporary generation, they're coming to hell, and suddenly their iPhone, they see that the signal is going. Nothing is going to be worse. Now, we move from Spain back up to France, where we find one of the great polymaths, one of the great minds of, of this kind of post-Renaissance period. And this is Blaise Pascal, a Jansenist, a priest, and, and just really an incredible man. For what we find next is that he achieved many things besides his satire. He invented the syringe and the hydraulic press. 
He helped with the study of Pascal's law of pressure and the theory of probability. He also helped with the study of the cycloid and invented the Pascal triangle and the first digital calculator. So when you hear of Pascal, he is this incredible mathematic genius that, that has come before. But what we find next is that he wrote the provincial letters, the letters to the provinces. And after the publication of these letters, the term Jesuit would become synonymous with crafty and subtle and cunning. And the word casuistry would never again be entirely free from a connotation of sophistry and excuse making. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church would place this book on the Index of Forbidden Books. Now, the Index of Forbidden Books was also established by Pope Paul IV that we saw, who did so many kind of bad things. Pascal accused the Jesuits of giving the lightest penance to aristocratic donors, the people who had money, to those who were privileged. They could confess their sins one day, recommit the same sin the next day, generously donate the following day, then return to reconfess their sins and thus buy their way out of damnation and into holiness. Next, you may have heard of Pascal's wager. And it's a wager basically saying, Pascal saying that faith cannot be proved, but what harm is going to come to you if you gamble on its truth and it proves false? If you gain, you gain everything. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then, without hesitation, that God exists and that he cares for you. Where we see that next is in these two little charts. Basically, if you believe in God and there is a God, you will have eternal joy. If you believe in God and there is no God, you've lived a good life and there's no consequence. If you don't believe in God and there is no God, your life is nothing. But if you don't believe in God and there is a God, there is eternal suffering or damnation. It is Pascal's wager. But back to his satire, in his provincial letters and in his book called Pensées, his thoughts, he talks about this vast difference between laughing at religion and laughing at those people who profane it by their extravagant opinions. With others of this period, like Du Bollet and Moliere and Kierkegaard, they are the ones who will attack the hypocrites and the shams in the church itself. So next he satirized the Jesuits and their casuistry, who those people who would not be excommunicated for putting off their habits, provided it was to dance, swindle, or go incognito into notorious houses of prostitution. Pascal would laugh at a story like the Jesuit who asked if he could drink while praying. No, said his superior. Ah, then, said the priest cannily. May I pray while drinking? Notice how they will use the logic and turn it to their advantage. Pascal also celebrated incongruity and has one of the greatest helps in, in making us see clearly what humor can be. And he says, basically, incongruity is when two faces resemble each other, make us laugh when together by their resemblance, though neither of them by itself makes us laugh. And so we see Don King here and his counterpart. We look at some of the others here and all of them look too, too similar. And when you put them side by side, they become humorous. Or lastly, next, we see even some other characters that are familiar to us. And we look at them and we see the similarity and the juxtaposition of resemblance makes us laugh at these funny characters. Next, we go to Moliere. And Moliere wrote one of the great books of the 17th century, Tartuffe, or The Imposter. And what that is next is his great satire to look at the purpose of satire. He says, if it's the function of comedy, to correct the vices of men and women. I do not see why anybody should be exempt. Such a condition in our society would be much more dangerous than the thing itself. And we have seen that the theater is admirably suited to provide correction. In fact, he says next, it is a great blow to vice 
to expose it to everyone's laughter. People can easily stand being reprehended, but we cannot stand being mocked. People are willing to be wicked, but we will not be made ridiculous. Now, next we find that Louis XIV in his court invited Moliere to share his supper. Uh, and, and they recognize that gentlemen are scandalized by Moliere's plays, not because it makes sport of heaven. It doesn't scandalize God, but because it makes sport of them as religious hypocrites. In fact, next, if we go to the play Tartuffe, we find that the husband Orgon is really naive. And he's taken into his horse a man who is pretending to be so devout and so holy, Tartuffe, the imposter. We think he is a holy man, but he is like a Jesuit. He's a casuist, a person who can take the sin out of sinning. And so he comes to seduce Orgon's wife. And Orgon has to be shown it by hiding under a table that this seduction is actually going on. In fact, next, we find that what Moliere is saying, he says, in a lofty, deceptive way, men have used the cause of God to mask their own private interests. And so Tartuffe, pretending to be holy, is going to try to seduce Orgon's wife. Now, next, however, we find that there is someone who is very smart and savvy about him and can really read right through him. And that's Doreen, the maid. And when she comes with a low-cut blouse at one point, Tartuffe says, hide that bosom that I might not, must not see. And Doreen says, it's strange that you're so easily excited. My own desires are not so soon ignited. And if I saw you naked as a beast, not all your hide would tempt me in the least. You are ugly, U-G-L-Y, ugly. But Tartuffe goes on with the wife, and he says, He's trying to seduce her with his words. He says, if you're still troubled, think of things this way. No one shall know about our joys except for us alone. And there's no evil until the act is known. It's scandal, madam, which makes it an offense. And it's no sin to sin in confidence. And so basically he's telling her, basically what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We can sin as long as people don't hear about it. For Moliere, the next thing is that the most forceful lines of a serious moral statement are usually less power than those of satire. And nothing will reform most men better than the depiction of their faults. It's a vigorous blow to vices to expose them to laughter. Criticism is taken lightly, but men will not tolerate satire. They are quite willing to be mean, but they never like to be ridiculed. And Moliere repeats this and echoes this over and over again. Now, next we go to a fabulous, a writer of fairy tales like Aesop, and that's Jean de La Fontaine. He's very absent-minded, bumbling, and scatterbrained, basically. But he says, I use animals to teach men. And what we see next is that we may recognize the tortoise and the hare or the mice that tried to bell the cat. Now, La Fontaine was, lived in a tortoise shell himself. He was friends with Moliere and Racine and Duboulet and all of these, these people. Um, and he was an enthusiastic lover of sleep. He would echo Sancho Panza's line, blessed be he who invented sleep. He loved sleep. But there are moral principles that emerge from his fables. In fact, next we find that he could take an everyday anecdote and make it into an ironic religious fable. For example, there's a news story about a priest who had accompanied a dead man in the funeral procession. And in his car, the hearse was upset and the coffin broke free and it broke the neck of the, pure, the poor priest. So Lafon takes that story, he embellishes the tale as a priest chants the usual psalms and litanies over the dead body even while he calculates how much money he's going to earn on this very lucrative occasion. He thinks of wine and hard cash, and he eyes the corpse as jealousy as though someone might steal it from him. When suddenly, the car lurches, it crashes, and the most generous parishioner coffin crushes him to death. The cure et la mort, the priest and death. 
But next we find one of my favorite about the cat who retired from the world. And it's a great satire on priests who make so much money and then can retire to the monastery with all the food and wine and leisure that they have. And so we have this rat who is a priest. Once a rat grew weary of all the cares which life assailed and to a Holland cheese withdrew. He grew fair, fat, and round. God's blessings thus redound to those who in his vows retire, he thought. One day this personage devout, whose kindness none might doubt, was asked by certain delegates that came from Rat United States for some small aid, for they to foreign parts were on their way for succor in the Great Cat War. This leads us next to Retopolis, the leaguered sore, their whole republic drained and poor. No morsel had they in their store. My friends, the hermit said, to worldly things I'm dead. How can a poor recluse to such a mission be of use? What can I do but pray that God will aid you on your way? And so, my friends, it is my prayer that God will have you in his care. His well-fed saintship said no more, but in their faces shut the door. What think you, reader, is the service for which I use this selfish rat to paint a monk? No, but a device. A monk, I think, however fat, must be more bountiful than that. And so we see that during the American Revolution, when the United States is coming over and asking the church for help against the British, at first they say no. Next, we find another great fable that came from La Fontaine. And this is the story of King Log and the King Stork. The frogs prayed to Jove for a king, not a log, but a livelier thing. Jove sent them a stork who did royal work, for he gobbled them up, did their king. The moral is, don't have kings. Now next, that gets to an entomologist, Derevich, who was an animator. And he produced uh, some Fontaine fairy tales, such as the frog who wanted to be a king. But what's interesting about this parable is that it parallels the parable of the trees and the brambles from the book of Judges, where the trees want a king and the brambles come and take over them and destroy them. Next, we move to another friend of La Fontaine and Moliere, and that's Nicolas Boileau de Provost. He writes, but satire ever moral, ever new, delights the reader and instructs him too. She, if good sense refine her sterling page, oft shakes some rooted folly of the age. Boileau realized next that he could satirize the worldliness of clergy. And the, they were fools, but there's always a bigger fool that would admire the clergy. And he wanted people to beware of that next. He believed Horace's redundo dicere verum. And this was the idea that one can speak the truth laughingly. And it says, my satires work best when they tickle and they bite simultaneously. And so he attacked fat and lazy ministers. In fact, he says, the only time the slothful gluttons of priests rush to chapel is when they hear a rumor of a sumptuous feast. But next in a little mock heroic epic called the lectern, uh, basically the pulpit, he deals with a quarrel between two church groups over where to place a lectern in a chapel. This is a bagatelle. It's kind of arguing about something so unimportant. But the best thing about this story is what comes next. And that is this satire on pettiness and the kind of laziness of the clergy it features a fight at the bookstore. And some books that hit people are so boring that the victims immediately fall asleep, which is why I do not throw my books at my students when I'm teaching my classes. I'm afraid they may succumb to the same indolence that these other clerics did. Now we get to the last Frenchman of the day and that's Voltaire. Voltaire renounced religion. Uh, he used his satiric pen against the church, against Catholics, against Protestants, against everybody. Uh, his free thinking previewed the French Revolution where Dame Reason would be worshiped above all else. He apocryphally claimed that 100 years from the day of my death, 
there will not be a Bible on earth except one that is looked at upon by antiquarian curiosity seekers. However, it did not prove true. Bibles still abound in Voltaire doesn't. Some viewed him next as very cruel in his contemptuous levity towards all things holy. But he looked at priests and like some of the other Frenchmen saw those who rise from an incestuous bed they're manufacturing a hundred different versions of God. Then they eat and drink God. Then they piss and shit God. So he had a very low view of all of these clergy. In fact, what we'll find next is one of his famous lines that he actually believed. He said, if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. It's one way we can control the people. And it's something that Marx will pick up later on too, that we need a God and use him to kind of manipulate people in their actions. But we find next in one of his little philosophical tales, a conversation of the old satirist Lucian, Erasmus, and Rabelais. And the three satirists get together and they meet in the Elysian fields to discuss their common interest, which is satire. And Jonathan Swift joins them at the end and they all go off to drink and dine together, which led next to Voltaire's great work, Candide. And Candide was a satire on the philosopher Leibniz's optimism, where he would mouth the words, this is the best of all possible worlds. Now, if you're privileged, it is. But what we find next is that in this world, everything goes wrong for Candide and for his teacher, Dr. Pangloss, who basically gets uh, a sexual disease and and you've got to try to figure out how it works because there's a Franciscan, there's a Marquis, there's a Calvary captain, there's an explorer, there's a Jesuit. All of them are the ones who kind of passed on this uh, venereal disease to Dr. Pangloss, who loses his teeth and is covered in all kinds of pockmarks. It's a very ugly place. But for Voltaire next, he says, he looks at religion, he says, it began when the first scoundrel met the first fool. And he said, I've only had one prayer to God, a very short one. Oh, Lord, make my enemies ridiculous. And God granted it. But anyone could say that about anyone's enemies because we all turn out to be fools. The last and next thing we see is that at the end of Candide, the humanist who drank probably 40 cups of coffee a day did conclude with a great little line. He says, what is necessary to do is to cultivate our garden, to do good work, which essentially for the Christian is to love your neighbor. Next, we move to Denmark, where a quirky Dane, kind of a, looks like a, kind of a, a very strange little character, Soren Kierkegaard. In fact, Soren came to mean kind of goofy looking. Uh, but he said, my whole life is an epigram. It's, it's like a parable to make people aware and he has been seen as the father of existentialism, but even more so, we find that he is a great critic of Christianity gone bad. Where we see next is some of his parables, because he was a very devout Lutheran, and he talked about church people that would get dressed up every Sunday like geese, and the geese would gather every Sunday to hear a duck preach. The sermon was on what a high destiny geese have. Every Sunday, they would waddle home and eat, and then back to church next Sunday. All the geese flourished and grew fat, became plump and delicate, and then were eaten on St. Martin's Eve, the end. And so here is the parable of the church, where we don't really live it within our souls. We don't really have that passion that is a love of God and our neighbor, but we go in kind of a rote way to just follow the routine and the fashion and live it out very superficially. So next we find that he has this attack on Christendom. Christendom is separate from Christianity and upon the mediocrity there. And he says, imagine, there's a kind of medicine that is really helpful, but it possesses in full dosage a laxative effect, but in a half a dose, a constipating effect. Now suppose someone suffering from constipation was given, with very good intentions, a half a dose, because after all, it is at least something. 
And this is what he sees preaching in the church becoming. A congregation that is constipated is given something that will even make them more constipated. Next, Kierkegaard says, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, which most people who are skeptics and agnostics and cynics do. But the other is to refuse to accept what is true. And if the case for Christianity is true, if it is historical and authentic, then we must believe it. It leads to his last and next kind of parable, and that's the happy conflagration. And in this, he tells a story of a clown that comes on a stage and people are laughing and clapping. And as, as he's there, suddenly he realizes the theater is burning down. And he yells to the people, the theater is burning. And the crowd claps their hands in glee. They're happy. They cheer. They say, he's funny. He says, no, no, I'm serious. It's really burning down. And the audience claps even loudly and stomps their feet. It says, more, more. And one more time, he says, no, the theater is burning. At that point, it collapses and burns all the congregation. And so it is that the church is not going to realize that there are dangers out there. And so he recognizes that we've been given freedom, but we have not used our freedom the way that we should to really understand what God has done. Next, we come to a little cartoon for those who pretend to understand Kierkegaard. And so we move on from him to someone else that's pretty hard to understand. And that's next. We find someone reads Kierkegaard, but then someone just reads old notes she made on Nietzsche. So we go from the Dane down to the German. Now, Nietzsche next, we find that he is quite a character. Um, his echo homo, behold the man. In it, he has chapter titles that just really make me laugh. Uh, the kind of titles I wish I could write. He writes one title, why am I so wise? And then next, why am I so clever? And then third, why do I write such good books? And so he's playing ironically with his reader. But it, it's a very kind of fun way of, of looking at what you are doing and trying to get across. But next we find that Nietzsche will reject Christianity because he sees this heavy-handed God. And he wants a God who can dance, and thus spake their Zarathustra. And the Christian God he doesn't see as one who dances, but one who dies. And he also complains that Jesus pulls along with him all the weak and all of the, the, the dumb and the stupid, the people who have these great needs, and the marginalized people, and he wants people to come that are strong. Now, of course, no one ever has complimented the Germans on their sense of humor, because Nietzsche then gets to his idea next of the Ubermatch, the Superman, and the will to power. And so he wants someone who will assert himself. He wants a God that is strong, that gets rid of the riffraff. And he says, I don't like these coquettish, playful little bugs that in their insatiable desire to smell the infinite, make the infinite smell of bugs. In other words, these Christians who have made their God a man and that the man would come down among us being a God. No, that God would never do anything like that. God would never become such a small bug on earth. And he also kind of rejected something. He said, we should call every truth false which was not accompanied by at least one laugh. Now, if he had spent the time and read G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis and some other people coming in the 20th century, he's going to find quite a bit of laughter and faith coming together. But for now, he cannot hear any laughter in the Christian faith. But where that did lead us is next to the people who did believe in the Superman. And it's the Nazis who have this idea of the will to power that we can look at the bust of Nietzsche and realize this is what we want to become. Next, Nietzsche is famous for saying God is dead. But then there's the old graffiti that says, well, Nietzsche is dead by God. But he does have a good quip that he says, after coming in contact with a person who acts religious, I always feel I must wash my hands. There's a sense of something that is too slimy in the people like Tartuffe that we've met already. Next, we find another cartoon that says, as soon as I mention Nietzsche, stop serving me, okay? We've had too much to drink if we start talking about Kierkegaard and Nietzsche 
at the bar. But next, Nietzsche did once suggest ranking philosophers according to the importance of their idea of laughter. Yet William James believed that all of the laughter of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche reminded him of the sick shrieking of two dying rats. Their laughter is not that cheerful, buoyant, sanguine laughter of the saints, but that of one who believed in man. And so to close on Nietzsche next, we find that he gives us certain types of headaches. You may have a migraine listening to this, and after a while get some hypertension, and then stress, and then finally a discussion of Nietzsche himself is going to burn your whole head. One other German we see next is Karl Barth. Karl Barth stood up against the Nazis and the Nazi Lutheran Church in writing the Barman Declaration, and he wrote some of the best neo-Orthodoxy theology of the 20th century. And he wrote so much that he said, angels laugh at me, pushing my carts full of dogmatics, those books that I've written. But here was a German who laughed, a German who knew that what the Nazis were doing was wrong and stood up against them and preached orthodoxy, preached that God became man and suffered for us. But what he believed next was that humor is the opposite of all self-admiration and self-praise. And the one thing that the National Socialist Party did was praise themselves and lift and elevate themselves, not as Karl Barth would do to himself. In fact, next we find that he had a friend, Karl Zuckmeier, and he would correspond with him. And they were commiserating when they were in their late 80s about their bodies wrinkling and leaking, falling apart and shutting down. And they cheerfully shared a good laugh. He said, look, look, we cannot avoid being controlled by the less honorable members of our body. It's those things that we haven't taken care of, things that are hidden that are now making us a laughingstock. But this laughter is the closest thing to the grace of God because it makes us realize we cannot depend upon ourselves. We need someone else to laugh at. Now we close laugh with another little known Italian called the Unknown Comic. And the Unknown Comic is Giovanni Goretti. Giovanni Goretti based his young priest, Don Camillo, on a real person who had gone into the concentration camps. And the priest is a friend to a communist mayor's, Peponi. Now, Peponi spends a lot of his time kind of mocking and teasing and taunting Camillo. And so they have this kind of fighting relationship. And we, we see it next where kind of the, the little devil and the angel kind of fight each other. But what Goretzky wants us to realize that humor does not destroy. Humor re reveals what needs to be destroyed because it's bad. Humor heals anew, even with your enemy. And so the mayor Paponi, this, this communist comes and he'll often take Don Camillo's dog and he'll paint the kind of the rear end of his dog red, communist red, to remind him what he was doing. And so in fact, during the election, uh, Goretzky has Don Camillo get upset because the communist mayor wins. And he says, you know, I, I, I shouldn't have, he shouldn't win. This is not right, God. What are you doing? Let the communists win and the Roman Catholics. And, and God looks down at him and says, listen, you voted for him. And I want you to know that Mayor Pepponi didn't vote for himself. He voted for the Roman Catholics. And so there's this wonderful kind of little play. But what we see next is that Don Camillo, this priest, has these conversations, direct conversations in the book and in the film uh, Fernandel is, is, plays uh, Don Camillo in the film, uh, these direct, direct conversations with God. And at one point, he's really upset because coming home one night with his milk and eggs, someone knocks him down, and he spills all of his milk and knocks his eggs down, and he just wants to find out who this is. And Peponi comes into confession. He's a Roman Catholic, he's a communist. He comes in and he confesses. He says, Father, I have sinned. I have knocked down the priest and destroyed his eggs and milk. And that Don Camillo has to forgive him. He says, you know, go say 10 Hail Marys and, and 10 Our Fathers. And so as he goes to the altar and begins to kind of confess of his sins, we find that, that Don Camillo starts talking to, to God and Christ. And he says, now, can I go beat him up because of what he did? And he says, no, no, he, he's at the altar. He's confessing his sins. Well, can I take this candle and hit him on the head? He says, no, I bless those hands. And, and those hands cannot do any ill. He says, well, well, you didn't bless my feet. Can I kick him? And Jesus says, oh, okay, you can kick him. So he goes up and 
And as he's kneeling, the mayor Papone is kneeling there. Don Camillo comes and he kicks him in the rear. And the mayor turns around and says, thanks, I was waiting for that. I needed that. And so this love comes between the two of them. And this leads us kind of next to the last thing is that we find that there is laughter and loving one's enemy. That the mayor here and Don Camillo become the great friends who can talk with another even though they have different political and theological ideas. Because it is Christ that has come and said, you are to love your neighbor and to love your enemy. And sometimes they are the same person. And that leads us last and next to Fernandel as Don Camillo looking at us and says, this will make everyone laugh too. And the grace of God comes down. In spite of people like Voltaire and Nietzsche, we find that Kierkegaard and Karl Barth and Gretschy come and give us the grace of God and laughter. I'll see you next time.